Hi, welcome to the Vulnerable Scientist Podcast. This is your host, Sarah Nyakeri. On today's podcast, I'm going to tell you the seven biggest problems facing science, according to 270 scientists. So this is an article written by Julia Belouz, Brad Bloomer, and Brian Rensnick. It was written in 2016 in Vox. So, according to Paul Kalanithi, a neurosurgeon and writer between 1977 and 2015, he said, Science I have come to learn is a political, competitive, and fierce a career as you can find, full of the temptation to find easy paths. So, on to the seven challenges, biggest challenges that scientists face. This includes academia has a huge money problem. Second, so many studies are purely, poorly designed. Three, replicating results is crucial and rare. Four, peer review is broken. Five, too many science, too much science is locked behind paywalls. Six, science is purely, is poorly communicated. Number seven, life as a young academic is incredibly stressful. And I will go to number seven. When we asked researchers what they'd fix about science, many talked about the scientific process itself, about study design or peer review. There is, these responses often came from tenured scientists who loved their jobs but wanted to make the broader scientific project even better. But on the flip side, we heard from a number of researchers, many of them graduate students or postdocs, who are genuinely passionate about research but found the day-to-day -day experience of being a scientist grueling and unrewarding. Their comments deserve a section of their own. Today, many tenured scientists and research labs depend on small armies of grad graduate students and postdocs researchers to perform the experiments and conduct data analysis. These grad students and postdocs are often the primary authors or many, on many studies. In a number of fields, such as the biomedical sciences and postdoc position, is a prerequisite before a researcher can get a faculty level position at a university. Let me repeat that. In a number of fields, such as the biomedical, biomedical sciences, a postdoc's position is a prerequisite before a researcher can get a faculty level position at a university. This entire system sits at the heart of modern day science, a new card game called Lab Wars, Lab Wars poke fun at this dynamic. But these low level research jobs can be a grind. Postdocs typically work long hours and are relatively low paid for their level of education. Salaries are frequently pegged to stipends set by NIH, the National Research Service Award Grant, which starts at dollars forty-three uh, dollars and rise to $47,268 in year three. Postdocs tend to be hired on for one to three years at a time. And in many institutions, they are considered contractors, limiting their workspace protections. We heard repeatedly about the extremely long hours and limited family leave benefits. At PhD students in plant genetics in UC Davis, Don Gibson said, and the PhD or drastically change it. There is a high level of depression among PhD students. Long hours, limited career prospects, and low wages contribute to this emotion. Oftentimes, this is problematic for individuals in their late 20s and early to mid-30s who have PhDs and who may be starting families while also balancing a demanding job that pays poorly, wrote one postdoc who asked for anonymity. And this tells you why people ask for anonymity. This is just me coming in and bringing my emotions into this podcast. This level of flexibility tends to dispro di di disproportionately, eh, dis 
disproportionately affect women, especially women planning to have families, which helps contribute to gender inequalities in research. Okay, let me just comment on this. This wouldn't disproportionately affect women if women roles were not called women roles, especially when it comes to bringing up kids. Okay, it's something that we can't, you know, check out of it, the, the aspect where the woman is the one carrying the baby. But there's a part where, you know, in raising the child, um, when it comes to raising the child and, you know, giving those things that children need, if both parties were involved exclusive, like there's no, like one person who's doing more than the other, then this issue of gender inequalities research wouldn't come into place or gender inequalities when it comes to workplace settings because both parties will be suffering. And obviously if both parties are suffering and the people who are currently now in mostly in the in the bigger space are men, then it means that those men with themselves would even change those laws that come or policies that affect so-called women but if 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 this thing was affecting men equally and that would affect them if they were really involved in raising up a child or you know roles in terms of roles in the in the family then this wouldn't be an issue this would be a this wouldn't be a gender issue it, it would be a people's issue you know it wouldn't be a problem that affects women alone it would be a, a all this is our problem. All of us, this is a problem. <sighs> anyway, I, I got emotional for that. A 2012 paper found that female job applicants in academia are judged more harshly and are offered less money than male. There is very little support for female scientists and early career scientists, noted another postdoc. There is very little long-term financial security in today's climate. Very little assurance where the next paycheck will come from, wrote William Kenkel, a postdoc researcher in neuroendocrinology at Indiana University. Since receiving my PhD in 2012, I left Chicago and moved to Boston for a postdoc. Then in 2015, I left Boston, Boston for a second postdoc in Indiana. In a year or two, I will move again for a faculty job. And that's if I'm lucky. Imagine trying to build a life like that. This train can also adversely affect the research that young scientists do. Contracts are too, sh are too short term, noted another researcher. It discourages rigorous research as it is difficult to obtain enough results for a paper and hence progress. In two to three years, the constant stress drives otherwise talented and intelligent people out of science also. Because universities produce so many PhDs but have way fewer faculty jobs, available. Many of these postdoc researchers have limited career prospects. Some of them end up in staying stuck in postdoc positions for five oh my god for five or ten years or more. In the biomedical sciences, wrote the first postdoc quoted above, each available faculty position receives application from hundreds or thousands of applicants putting immense pressure on postdocs to publish frequently and in high-impact journals to be competitive enough to attain this, those positions. Many young researchers pointed out that PhD programs do fairly little to train people for careers outside of academia. So many PhD students are graduating for a limited number of professor positions with minimal training for careers outside of academic research. Noted Dawn Gibson, a PhD candidate studying plant genetics at UC Davis. Laura Wing Wingantna, a graduate researcher in evolutionary ecology at Indiana University, agreed the university, specifically the faculty advisors, know how to train students for any other than academia, which leaves many students hopeless when in inevitably there are no jobs in academia for them. Add it up, and it's not surprising that we had plenty of comments about anxiety and depression among most graduate students and postdocs. There's a high level of depression among PhD students, writes Gibson. 
Long hours, limited career prospects, and low wages contribute to this emotion. A 2015 study at the University of California, Berkeley, found that 47% of PhD students surveyed could be considered depressed. Oh my goodness, that's a very huge number. Doesn't mean that having doesn't have. It uh, doesn't mean that a lower number is less less uh, alarming, but oh, that's a huge number. The reasons for this are complex and can't be solved out, overnight. Pursuing academic research is already an arduous, anxiety-ridden task that pound, bound to take a toll on mental health. But as Jennifer Walker explored recently at Quartz, many PhD students also feel isolated and unsupported, exacerbating those issues. Fixes to keep these young scientists in science. Okay, let's see what people are suggesting to keep these people in science. We had plenty of concrete suggestions. Graduate schools could offer more generous family leave policies and child care for graduate students. There could also increase the number of female applicants they accept in order to balance out the gender disparity. But some respondents also noted that workplace issues for grad students and postdocs were inseparable from some of the fundamental issues facing science that we discussed earlier. The fact that university faculty and research labs face immense pressure to publish but have limited funding makes it highly attractive to rely on low-paid postdocs. Let me just repeat that. The fact that university faculty and research labs face immense pressure to publish but have limited funding makes it's highly attractive to rely on low-paid postdocs. There is little incentive, incentive for universities to create jobs for these graduates or to cap the number of PhDs that are produced, right? Like Nguyen Gatna. Young researchers are highly trained but relatively inexpensive sources of labor for faculty. The substantial bias against women and ethnic minorities and blind experiments have shown that removing names and institutional affiliations can radically change important decisions that shape the careers of scientists. Wow. There's a substantial bias against women and ethnic minorities and blind experiments have shown that removing names and institution affiliations can radically change important decisions that shape the careers of scientists. I don't understand that, but I think I can understand. This is Perry McClean, a professor of biology, California State University, Dominguez Hills. Some respondents also pointed to the mismatch between number of PhDs produced each year and the number of academic jobs available. A recent feature by Julie Gold in Nature explored a number of ideas for revamping the PhD system. One idea is to split the PhD into two programs, one for vocational careers and one for academic careers. The former will better train and equip graduates to find jobs outside academia. This is hardly an exhaustive list. The core point underlying all these suggestions, however, was that universities and research labs need to do a better job of supporting the next generation of researchers. Indeed, that's arguably just as important as addressing problems with the scientific process itself. Young scientists, after all, are by definition the future of science. Wayne Knatta, whatever that name is, okay, I'm sorry <laughs> for butchering the name, but he's W E I N G A R T I N E R, concluded with a sentiment we saw all too frequently. Many creative, hardworking, and strong or underrepresented scientists are aged out of science because of these issues. Not every student or university will have all of this unfortunate experience, but they are pretty common. There are a lot of young, disillusioned scientists out there now who are expecting to leave research. Science needs to correct its greatest weakness. I think this is the conclusion of the article, and let me just point it out. Science is not doomed. For better or for worse, it still works. Look no further than the novel vaccines to prevent Ebola. The discovery 
the discovery of gravitational waves or new treatments for stubborn diseases. And it's getting better in many ways. See the works of meta researchers who study and evaluate research, a field that has gained prominence over the past 20 years. Okay, I won't finish it up, but it's just refreshing to hear what other young researchers think about their academia. Of course, I'm not an PhD student, but I can relate to some of the things um, they say, especially when hear, hearing what other PhD students and postdocs complain about. And yeah, it's just a sad affair. Do you want to start your own podcast? Start with some simple gear that you already have and a quiet space. Simple gear includes a microphone, editing software, and host of your podcast. Simple microphones include the ones on your phones and computers or a simple recorder, which you can upgrade later. For the editing software, I use Audacity, which is free and simple to use. Buzzsprout, which over a thousand other fellow podcasters like me use, is one of the podcast hosting providers you can use. Buzzsprout has helped me link my show on every major podcast platform with the endless number and regularly updated tutorials and good customer service support Buzzsprout offers, my podcasting journey has been made easy. Following the link in the show notes, let Buzzsprout know we sent you, gets you a $20 Amazon gift card if you sign up for a paid plan, and helps support our show.